Do your business finances make you want to vomit? Are you afraid of getting into your numbers because of what it might mean about you? Do you de uh, delay getting everything ready for your accountant or do you delay getting all your ducks in a row until the very last minute for tax season? And do you desire to have some different habits so that you are not afraid of numbers in your business? Fear and finances and overcoming all of this is what we are talking about today on the Possibility Mom Live. <music> Money is a topic that I get into quite a bit here on the Possibility Mom Live because I think it is an essential conversation to have in entrepreneurship. I talk about this all the time. You can do things for a hobby, like you can pursue a passion and offer it as a service to others as a form of charity or as a simply something that you enjoy. I know a lot of people who help their friends with things because they enjoy it, because they have a passion for it. And they happen to have a, a sense of, uh, you know, some acumen around it, like they're good at it. But when we start charging and taking it one step further, when we start to care about profit in a business, so making more then we spend, that is when we have a business. So this is an essential conversation. P.S. My fire alarm is unfortunately low on batteries and it is going to beep through this whole conversation. So I apologize in advance, but it is worth it to persevere because I think every entrepreneur and whether you have a business or not, I think you could benefit largely from this conversation. Every entrepreneur goes through a come to Jesus moment, let's call it, where they have to come to terms with their numbers. Maybe they're not making enough money. money. Maybe they have a really challenging uh, tax season where they owe a lot more than they realize. Like maybe there's been a time when, you know, you get the credit card bill and you're just like, oh my gosh, all these things are not adding up. I think every entrepreneur has that moment. And what I am striving to do in this episode is, is to give you, with my very special guest, some things that you can do today. So that number one, if you find yourself in a situation where you are feeling over your head already and like, oh my gosh, there's no hope for me. There's no way I can get out of this. I want to give you some concrete recommendations for how to change your mindset and start to see this as an opportunity for you. And I also want to give the brand new entrepreneur or the entrepreneur who is uh, just starting out, who is perhaps right at that beginning stage, this is the best time to start <laughs> getting your finances in order at the very, very, very beginning. So I am so excited to welcome to the Possibility Mom Live, the beautiful Virginia Braun. Virginia, welcome. Hi. How are you? Good. How are you? Oh my gosh. I'm so excited to get into this conversation. You look so pretty. For those of us who are watching on YouTube, look how pretty you look. For anyone who might not know you and what you do, introduce yourself, please. Yeah, so um, I'm Virginia Braun. I'm the owner of Braun Virtual Solutions, which is a full service bookkeeping business. Um, however, with a small caveat. So, and this is something that we're going to kind of delve into today, but um, you can do two things in your books. So one is you can hire a bookkeeper that can do compliance work, which is the things that the IRS cares about, which is making sure that your expenses are in, making sure that you know your full profit. Um, 
However, on the flip side, the beautiful thing about bookkeeping services is that it can be very advisory. So um, when you work with me, I'm more about the advisory perspective than I really am about compliance. I want you to be successful and grow in your business, which I think is what we're going to talk about today. So um, so that's what I do. And I love it. I absolutely love it. Um, and I'm just excited to be here. So help people understand for anybody who might not know, what is the difference between an accountant and a bookkeeper? Okay. Um, an accountant is someone that, first of all, has gone through ridiculous amounts of education on tax law. So the actual things that um, you, the IRS is looking for from a tax compliance perspective, a bookkeeper is the person that handles the day to day. Um, so anybody that's ever had the um, fortunate, unfortunate <laughs> Um, audit situation has always dealt with a CPA who is going through their bookkeeping, really their records in order to understand what the actual financial reality of the business is. The bookkeeper handles the day to day to make sure that once you when and if you get to that perspective, that that place um, in your business, that your records are in order in order to answer the questions. I actually just had a conversation yesterday with somebody and he said, you know, Virginia, I just feel like um, my records are not great. And I don't know, like, do I really need to do this? Like, let's just start from scratch. And I said, no, no, no. He said, all of my numbers are up for interpretation. And I said, oh, okay, that is not good. Your numbers are black and white. I say that quite frequently, they are black and white. So if I have to interpret anything with your numbers, you are in for a world of hurt. So your bookkeeper makes sure that those records speak for themselves in case of someone asking questions. Does that make sense? Yes, absolutely. Yeah. And share with us why you got into this world in the first place. Why is this such a important field for you? Yeah, that's a hard one. Um, I grew up in a home of entrepreneurs. So my mom was a housekeeper. Um, and had many clients. And my stepfather was um, kind of like a handyman contractor and did landscaping and things like that. Um, and it was great because I had two parents that were very available, which I think a lot of people go into entrepreneurship for the flexibility. So they were always available. Um, but money was never great. Um, there was always never enough. And, um, and this is where... <laughs> My, my stepdad ended up having an accident. So he ended up hurting his hand and having to get surgery. And because he was out of the business, things started to go completely haywire. Um, they weren't collecting on invoices quickly enough and they were underpricing for their services. And eventually the business had to fold. Um, the blessing for me personally was that um, my parents are divorced. And so my dad was carrying our health insurance. And I remember at that time, you know, not only were we like not eating meat because we couldn't afford it, but we were also having struggles with paying for health insurance because that's who was covering it. So the insurance ended up, you know, just falling out and, um, and it was horrible. And I remember my mother saying, you know, I never thought that I would ever say this, but like, it's such a blessing that your dad carries your health insurance because right now we don't have any. Um, and that was, that was, it was, it was devastating for a young family to to lose two primary sources of income. My mom then had to go and work um, a corporate job again because she had to carry the insurance and my stepdad was still on disability. And that was pretty much the end of their marriage. I mean, it just kind of um, was this horrible, you know, ripple effect that um, led to the end of their marriage. So it, it was rough. And I, my goal in my business is to keep people at least in the know and advise them on ways to stay in business so that they can support their families. This is where you and I are just so aligned. We really both care about families staying together at home for those who have discerned that. And I, we are so aligned in easing financial stress on families. You know, thank you for sharing so vulnerably your personal experiences. Um, and, you know, and I have all kinds of stories too, where, uh, you know, for me, it's very mental health motivated. It's very um, the ability to have a large family and make choices motivated. But regardless of your motivation, money is black and white. Like, like I, I think that's a great phrase uh, that I'm going to borrow. Like sure. we, we, we just, 
if numbers are up for interpretation, that it's problematic. Like, you know, and I've got, I know I've got listeners in both the U S and Canada. So whatever, and, and internationally, so whatever government body is uh, yours that you have to be in compliance with, it, it's just, it's just a reality. And I think, you know, why, Virginia, tell us why you think sometimes, and myself included, I have many seasons. I can, if I were to really draw the timeline of my own history with money, um, we, I would write a, 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 vo a volume of books. I would be writing an encyclopedia of books because I have all kinds of things that I get coached on in terms of money. But why do you think there is so much fear around funds and finances in a business? It is the most common thing I hear about, and I know you hear about it too from the people that you help. Why is fear so prevalent in entrepreneurs? Uh, it's number one, 100%, the fear of failure. So in business, you're in business, and, and this is the definition between a hobby and a business, is profit. So if you are not making money, you immediately feel like a failure. And so um, a lot of people will say, well, I, I don't even want to look at it because there's the prospect that I'm losing money and, and that's a reality. And, and to be completely honest, there are lots of businesses that are not making money currently. Um, and so that fear of failure, especially when you are, you've put so much into it, you know, you've been an entrepreneur for a long time. It's the sacrifices and the time and um, you wear your heart on your sleeve because this is what you have poured so many hours and time into. Um, the reality of that failing is kind of an unacceptable reality for most people. And so I think that that would be the number one reason why people just fear that, oh my gosh, what happens if I'm not making money? And it's like, you pivot, you pivot and you fix it. That's what you do. Um, so I would, I would say that. <laughs> so I'd love to hear an example yeah. of somebody who maybe came to you full of fear. So they didn't want to know what their numbers really were so that maybe they would avoid being disappointed, mm -hmm. all that kind of stuff. But then you were able to get their books cleaned up, give them some great advice, and they were able to make some better choices and pivots moving forward. Have you got a great example of that? Yeah. So I am super proud of a business that I, I'll leave on names because I didn't get his permission to talk about it. But um, so he works in a very um, fluid, cash fluid business. And I started with him from the very beginning. So he found me on um, a site that's mostly with startup businesses. And so I was able to get his books in line. And once we had the numbers, we started to see that there was a trend. Um, and the biggest trend was that he, um, so he takes on income and then he has to immediately pay contractors. So the contractor margin between what he was earning and what he was paying contractors was not good enough. And we started to see that very quickly. Um, and so, yes, it has taken us a couple of months. We've also had to have tougher conversations of, I love that you want to pay yourself, but you cannot afford the salary that you're paying yourself. You can't afford the subcontractor salary that you're paying. And so part of my job was to ask the questions. And really that's all that it does is it gets started with, so you know that $4,000 that you paid the subcontractor? tell me a little bit about what they're doing for you so that we just make sure that you have a good return on investment. And it only takes that. So I actually talk to him. We, every month I meet with my clients one-on-one -on -one to just go through their numbers and, and ask the questions and start looking for strategies. Um, and he even said, I just want to tell you that my salary is up and I want to explain why. And I was like, that's awesome. So like you have a, there's a why behind the higher salary and that's wonderful. He knew fully well that he was not going to make profit that month. Um, but then we had, we have a three month plan moving forward and that's really just someone to bounce the ideas off. Um, it is not fun. Gosh, I've worked with him for almost a year now. It's not fun to have a constant conversation about losing money, but the beauty of it is I can see the trends that like, we are almost back in the black. We are almost making money and it's huge. Um, and so, you know, that I just love working with people that are they're willing to be vulnerable and open in order to have conversations to get past it. Because the reality is that your business will not always make money. And that is from me personally, um, even though I do this for a living, um, there, are, there are choices that you're going to have to make that sometimes are going to be 
non-profitable. The goal though is to, A, number one, learn from that experience. So like, why didn't it work? And number two is how do we get back on track? And so that's, you know, the flip side of the conversation. I think sometimes we don't think through what actually happened, first of all. So that retrospective, um, you know, conversation with ourselves and our trusted, you know, trusted people in our circle. But then more importantly is, okay, how are we going to get back on track? Knowing fully well, it does not happen overnight. So I think- there is so much mindset work in entrepreneurship. So meaning we have to constantly be investing in our mindset. And I just really want everybody listening to this to, to hear me, like stop what you're doing. If you're driving, like be safe, but just really listen to my words. We are always going to be our own worst enemy. It's, it's just the reality. Like, we are going to, especially if you have well-worn neural pathways where you're telling yourself the same thing. So for example, I'm always going to be bad with money. For a lot of entrepreneurs, that is a well-worn neural pathway. Another one might be like, um, I'm irresponsible with my money. I'm never going to make money. I was just coaching somebody on this exact one. I'm never going to make money. I'm always going to spend more than I make. If you have this phrase in your head that you say to yourself constantly, constantly, another great visual I like to say, it's like a trench, right? The more you say that phrase, that sentence in your brain, that thought, it's like you're digging the trench, the digging the trench, you're digging the trench until it can be like a hundred feet deep. I want everyone to picture themselves as if you're standing in a hundred foot deep trench where you can barely see the light of day, but you can see it, but you can barely see the light of day. Why it's so important to have people like Virginia, to have people in your world, even if they're just a friend or your mom or whoever, like somebody to speak truth and life into you. <laughs> and for somebody with Virginia's experience in, in money, like who can say, listen, it's going to be okay. We're going to make a plan. If we don't have that, you're going to stay in that trench. And it is sometimes very difficult to, to claw yourself out of it. Another visual that just came to me, and, and Virginia, tell me if this resonates. I'd love to hear your response. But it's like, say you're standing in that trench. I think doing it on your own is kind of like you're just like climbing like and you're trying to just like take your fingernails and put them into the, the dirt and you're just trying so hard to find little footholds but you keep slipping and you might make a little bit of progress but it's messy whereas there could be like three feet away from you a ladder like that I think that's a really like interesting powerful visual that there are people who can help nobody is too far gone do you agree with me? Yeah. And I almost, I don't even think that the walls are made of dirt. I think that they're made of mud and you feel like the, somebody is putting a water hose on the path that you're trying to go up. Right. Um, and I think that so often this is why, and I loved, um, I've, I've been coaching with, uh, Lisa for a little while now. And I love that idea that, um, we were never, well, we were never meant to do life alone. So I don't know why we ever think that we are meant to do entrepreneurship alone. Um, it's it's just like working in an office, except you've, you've self-isolated yourself because you're in business on your own, right? And we cannot see, to your point, the ladder that's literally right there. So I am a huge advocate of um, masterminds, coaching, things of that nature, because it really is sometimes so blatantly obvious to us when we're outside of it. And, and this is really with anything. So like even something as simple as like, I don't have a process in place for my leads. That's a problem. Like, and, and if I can provide, and I have a very easy source to like do your lead or to, you know, track your leads and everything, but you can't see it because you're stuck in the mud trying to eke your way out of it, you cannot do business by yourself. You can't. Oh, amen. You were meant to. You were not meant to do business by yourself. Stop like, trying. <laughs> listening, that is like, that is me. I'm in the mud and I don't want to be here anymore. What is the very first thing someone can do? 
to get, get out. Your, yeah. It's called get your highlighters. So you need your handy dandy highlighters. You need a pink and a green. And what you do is you start with whatever banking. So yes, I have opinions about your banking. I don't care what you're using right now. It could be your personal checking account or whatever, but you print off the statements that you haven't already filed taxes on and you start mucking through it with a highlighter and you just pink for expenses and green for money that's coming in. And that's the first step is you just make sure that you understand those transactions um, because a light bulb will go off. It's, it's even just that the forced activity of physically highlighting it will force you to acknowledge where you're at in your business. Ooh. Okay. Then what? So now we've got my pink and green pieces of paper. It's all looking very colorful. What do I do now? Okay. The next thing that you need to do is you need to get it into some kind of format. So yes, it's nice to see pink and green, but one thing to always rec remember is that you're always going to have more pink than green. So your green transactions, typically, unless you work in something where like you, you have a $5 product that you're constantly pulling money in from, um, but typically your pinks are always going to be bigger than your greens. What you need to do is if you're a paper person, great, write it out. Although that sounds painful. Um, but if you're a, if you're electronic, which I'm a huge fan of G Suite, um, get into Google Sheets and just start putting expenses. Do it by month. So we're in 2022, start with January. And I want you to start actually listing out first on the column to the left, you want to put who the vendor is. So like Google is a great one. We all, You should have G Suite. Just go ahead and buy it. It's $12 a month. And then for January, how much did you spend? So vendors on one side, months along the top. Um, and literally start building the budget because that's your that is your budget. You're look you're simply looking at how much did I spend with this person in this month. Then you start with February and you'll see like oh okay G Suite is a monthly expense. Once you have it on a spreadsheet, then we do the audit and the audit is liberating and terrifying at the same time because the reality is once you know what those expenses are, how much did I spend versus how much did I make. You should always be auditing. I I make, I think I make plenty of money um, for what our, our family needs right now. Um, even I will go through and I will audit every single month. And it's hard thing. It's like my assistant and I just had a conversation of like, please tell me, like, is this really an expense that I need? And she was like, yes. And let me explain to you why. Again, I do not do this by myself. So Hannah was like, yes, you need this. This is why we need this. Like, I need this. She was like, okay, great. That's fine. As long as I can understand what the justification is of the expense. Um, but sometimes, especially if you're not making money, sometimes you're going to have to pull on your big girl boots and do some things manually that it would be really helpful to do with an app, but it's really just not in the cards right now. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, Especially mm -hmm. if it's between two expenses where like there is so much return on investment here, but yes, this is nice, but it's really, it's not a necessity. Those are the kinds of conversations that you should be having with yourself and just knowing that this is a season. So once you're able to turn things around, then yeah, we can go back to using whatever app you thought that was, you know, just a total game changer. Um, but you have to do the audit. It's, it's important. And it's something that as the CEO of your business, you should be doing on a consistent basis as well. And no one's going to care about this. Like you will, like I, no. I, I, it's really important to remember. I, I, no. I have, um, I have a funny, well, not funny. It's, it's, it was very eye opening when I did it. So I had accumulated over, I don't know, I, I guess you'd call me an online entrepreneur. I think around 2015 is when I really took things online. Prior to that, I was very much in-person interior design. I wouldn't say that my business was very much like online. Anyway, but I had started watching all the webinars and taking advantage of all the fast action bonuses of all <laughs> these webinars from around 2015. And eventually I was just like, oh gosh, <laughs> like there's a lot of charges on my credit card every single month. And when I tallied them up, these little like $97 app here, $47 charge here, some of them are big, like $197, $497, I realized that I had so many technical apps, like tech, like just like different things, tech related things that were 
easily totaling, if I remember correctly, it was about fifteen hundred dollars. That was a how month. A month. That was how my business was set up at the time yeah. to just keep the lights on technically, like from a tech point of view. And I just had to take this really hard look and be like, do I really need such a robust email provider? I was on a, um, anyway, I was on one of the very large, I don't want to, I don't need to name any names, but I was on a very large, very popular email software that I had just, to be honest, taken advantage of a special deal at a conference as these things happen and was paying, if I'm not mistaken, $497 a month. And then I had another thing that um, was sort of a connecting app between a lot of things that was like mm -hmm. 97 a month again, and so on and so forth. I discovered Kartra and I was like, Kartra is $99 a month and it did 80% of all my other technical apps. Yeah. Calendly, I used to use Calendly in my business. It was, I think $19 is Calendly. I can't remember. But anyway, my point is, I could not believe it. Like, and I think sometimes we can obviously get excited about certain things when you're at a conference or you're at a thing. I'm not trying to throw shade at anybody's business. Like so many of these companies do such great things. Mm -hmm. If there are alternatives or if these things are not providing the, the return and there are adequate alternatives, I just think we have to do that hard exercise of, hey, yeah, it might be a little bit of effort to move everything over, you know, but what is going to be the trade-off? So I went from $1,500 a month to $197 a month. And I just was like, and how long have I been <laughs> doing this? Tell me, Virginia, I'd love to know in your business, yeah. give me one like amazing savings that you did because of an audit. Yeah. Okay. So I'm not going to say the name of the business, but it was this massive marketing machine. And actually it was when I started working with you. Um, and basically it was supposed to do everything that Kartra does and more, you know, it was like this amazing thing. And honestly, the number one thing I am like, um, gosh, yeah, I am a course queen. I, I will, education is my jam. I, I will spend a lot of money on good quality education. This whole marketing machine came with education. And it once I took the hard look at like, okay, um, what is what is really drawing me to this software? It was the education that came with it and not the automation. Um, that was $300 a month. So on top of everything else that I was spending, I started to realize like, that is unacceptable. <laughs> So it was like, okay, we, I have to move on. Do I want this education? Absolutely. But you know what, if it really came down to it at the end of the day, and I think this is also something we have to remember, there are worlds of information out there. If I need to learn something like in my business, sales tax, I love sales tax. I could take education all day. There are beautiful free webinars on state you know, Department of Revenue websites that will give me the same information. So um, again, you know, we, that was the hard audit that I did. Um, do I miss it? Not one bit. Once I, again, mindset, once I made the mental shift in my head that like, okay, we're just going to go back to what we were doing. We were just like, okay. And what was, what happened was what I thought was going to be the biggest nightmare on earth ended up turning into like this awesome. Like we're, we got this, it's going to be great. Um, and we were able to do everything that we needed to. So, um, but I think it's that mental shift. And I think, and I think that fear part of it comes into play when, if you're like me, and I think this is your audience where you are a mom, an entrepreneur, a wife, you are volunteering at your parish, you are volunteering for PTA. You're trying to get your volunteer hours in so that you can get a discount on tuition you are asking and begging the Lord for whatever the quick fix savior technology is going to be. And guys, they are going to sell you on it. And it's really hard to have the self-control and the, you know, the discernment to say, what am I really trying to do? And is this really what I need? And I would say six times out of 10, it's a no, it's really not. Um, now, I am a huge advocate though, and again, this can't be the fix, but like pay 
people to help you rather than subscribe to apps. And, mm-hmm. and that's, so I'm a huge advocate of hire rather than try to automate because there are beautiful people out there that this is what they do um, and they know the technology. So even if you want to try a new technology, you can hire someone, support their family yeah. and support them and have an expert do it. Um, so I'm a big fan of outsourcing. I think that it's, it is pivotal in your business at a certain point that you, you need to hire out. Yeah, that's, that's huge actually, you know, and it's something I coach a lot of women in business. We provide like in wealth without guilt, I provide quite a few templates and videos. And what I notice is that the people who have people who can move that forward or the people who actually have tech skills themselves, they're able to take further steps because there's somebody moving it along at a faster rate than having to, you know, so I do notice that just to your point that when you hire a human being to move it forward, I think what it is like truly at the heart of that is again, it's the mindset stuff. Yeah. Because our thoughts can so often just stop us in our tracks and and lay things and anyway, but that's a whole other conversation. Okay. So listen, anybody listening to this who is feeling like, Nope, I am too far gone. There is no hope for me. I still have a drawer or a shoebox or a whatever full of receipts that I've never looked at. I have expenses on five different credit cards. Like, I am too far gone. There is no hope. What would you tell them, Virginia? So, um, to qu- to use the the phrase coined by somebody else, um, your, your income is your greatest asset. Okay. So, um, what you have to remember is that your income, what you were bringing in is your greatest asset. We don't always use it appropriately. Um, so I talk about just like the saints, we need a posse of financial things to help us accomplish what we need to with money. Um, and the number one thing that you need to do is you have to parcel out your money. So um, A number one is you have to protect your personal assets and your business. So if you have not, some people will fight me on this and I don't care. You need an LLC. You need to create a financial entity that is going to protect you and your family in case of any blow up with your business. It just is what it is. It's like buying insurance. And then you need to get some stinking accounts that have nothing to do with your family, right? So again, we have to separate and it's about protection. It's like, if I, if something were to happen and you go into an audit, if you've used a personal bank account, that opens you up to a full audit of your personal finances. And that is not the point. If you were to be, um, you know, sued or something like that, if you're using a personal bank account, all of those assets are available now. You have to separate. So divide and conquer. Once you've created those accounts, then you need even more accounts, which sounds ridiculous, but um, you need at least three accounts in your business. I really do recommend five, but if you're going to have the minimum, it's three. Yeah. Um, And so uh, I use a bank called Relay. I love Relay. Every account is free. Um, So you can have 10 accounts if you really want to. I have seven right now because I'm working on some side projects. So I'm squirreling away money but that's what you have to do. So number one is you have to have a tax account. So if you are not already saving for taxes, it's going to bite you in the butt. So you need to be separating that out and putting money aside for taxes. The second thing that you need is you need to have a profit account. Okay. Um, That profit account is there so that you are able to pay that stuff off. Also cash is king during a recession. So if you want to recession proof your business, you got to have cash in the bank. So you use that profit account in order to squirrel money away. And the third one would be your income and expenses account. So you can, if you want to, you can kind of keep them all loosey goosey in the same account, but that only holds the money that you absolutely need to cover expenses. Um, now your profit account is one where you kind of let it sit a little bit. So um, you know, wait until the end of the month. Once all of your expenses have been, you know, taken care of, whatever is left in that profit account um, is really what you're going to use in order to pay down debt. Or let's say, um, you know, for me, if you have a, a big launch or something like that coming up, you need to set the money aside because you need to make sure, as scripture teaches us, 
to count the cost. You need to count the cost before necessarily launching into something new. Um, and so that's really what that is for. I love it. Um, I learned this from Garrett Gunderson from Wealth Factory, if I'm not mistaken. He suggests you put that one of those accounts, maybe the profit one, in a separate bank. So you don't even see it like a different company, like a cut, like where you're not like looking at it often. If I'm not mistaken, I learned that from him. My, um, my bank, uh, I use a local bank here in Florida and they laugh at me because I think I have five, but like, I don't know which one is which I, I've never labeled them properly. So when I go up to the teller, like when I go, when I bank online, they're labeled, but like when I go to the teller, they'll be like, uh, they're always like, which account? So anyway, note to self, have some sense of what, what accounts are what. Okay. I've got two more things I want to talk about. I could talk to you all day. I know. Oh, sorry. The time's going so fast. Two more things I want to talk about. Thing number one is what is your biggest pet peeve about your fellow bookkeeping colleagues and how to make entrepreneurs feel? I hate when people make their clients feel stupid. It drives me crazy. Here's the thing. Unless you are a bookkeeper, and this even goes for bookkeepers. So I deal with sales tax, which is like not something that most bookkeepers are willing to even touch with a 10 foot pole. Don't make people feel stupid. This is not what they do. Guys, this is not what you do. This is not your mode of genius. If you're a bookkeeper watching this, great. I hope that you are, you know, knowledgeable in what you do. But like you did not go into bookkeeping. You should not feel stupid. If you have anybody talking to you about finances that makes you feel stupid, stop and walk away. Because this is not this is not on you. You are not meant to know this. Um, I really want everyone to hear what Virginia just said. Like I could cry just hearing it. I think it's one of the things I find most refreshing about you. My mindset coach, Erin Ingold, uh, I want to say this was about six months ago, maybe. And um, I was talking about money with her and I was just like, I feel so stupid. Like I just kept using that over and over again. I feel so stupid. I feel this, I feel that. And she just was like, why do you think like you would have expertise in this area? Like she, she literally was just like kind of shaking me by the shoulder. She was like, this is just not an area you have expertise. And she was kind of like, it's like you assume you should. And I was like, you're right. Like, and why am I getting mad at myself for not having the expertise? So I really think that's just such an important thing to remember if you are feeling like your current team is making you feel stupid, Virginia is not going to make you feel that way. <laughs> so just, it's not worth it because who are you, when, why are you going to ask questions to someone who makes you feel stupid? Like you need to have someone in your corner that is willing to put the time and energy into making sure that you understand in a language that you know. So don't let people make you feel stupid. It's unnecessary. There's I, know better. I know people that will love you for all of the things that you have going on. There's we may we may say like you're a mess, but you know, there is an empowerment. I I think this is the thing that I really want to like hit home in this conversation. You have basically like many options as an entrepreneur. There's the option to keep your head in the sand, of course, and and never look. And where does that lead? That can lead to audits. That can lead to massive debt. Right. That can lead to you know, stress and strain, whatever, all those kinds of things. I don't mean to get too scary or make people afraid, but not being aware simply leads like just by reason, like following reason is going to lead to continued lack of awareness and continued like stumbling in the dark, right? Whereas awareness can lead to decisions. Like for me, going from $1,500 in tech apps to one monthly payment, you know, just an enormous amount of things that can come from awareness. So Virginia, you, and you have the choice. That's the thing I want to, like, you have the choice and the choice can lead to amazing things. So you have something coming up that I'm so excited about in August to help people feel empowered about this choice. Tell us about your upcoming five-day challenge. Yeah. You know, I'm kind of overwhelmed about what we're going to do in five days. Um, so I, 
I now that I'm thinking through like, gosh, financial freedom and peace in five days is amazing. But it's called Overcoming Financial Fear. And it's a free five day challenge, free five days financial peace for free. Um, and really what it is, is it's I am so tired of you guys feeling like this. And so basically what we're going to do is we're going to start with CEO mindset. What does that look like? We're going to then conquer the statements. And I'm going to tell you how to properly set up your business finances. Um, I I need to do something about that video. Um, <laughs> but really, <laughs> so we're going to go through like, how do you file an LLC? How do you, how do we do this and set myself up for success? And then finally, we're going to go through what are the routines? What's the tech stack that I need? Um, and what is the process that I need to do in order to make sure that I'm maintaining and staying on top of it? So it really is, it's like a five-day boot camp that we're just going to get you into the right place so that you can understand your numbers, but more importantly, you turn them around. If they need to be turned around, we're going to get it in order and you'll, you'll know where we need to make some adjustments. I, I just wish this is the kind of thing I wish I had at the beginning of my entrepreneurial journey. I think I would feel a lot less, you know, stupid. <laughs> and again, I just, everybody has a choice. You have a choice for how you show up for your clients. You have a choice for how you show up for your family. And you have a choice in how you show up for your finances. And this is something that can unlock just incredible potential, incredible. Um, uh, it, something I hear you talk about, Virginia, is like a docility. Like this can unlock a docility and an obedience, but in a great way. Maybe as we just close, you can share with us like why it's important to involve God and be docile even in your numbers. We all have a mission and we all have something that God has placed in our hearts. Um, so if you've discerned that business is for you, there is a mission there. There is something that God has created you to accomplish. You cannot do that if you are not in business. You, you absolutely, you cannot provide for your family if you are not bringing home money. Um, and I feel very strongly that your, your numbers will tell you what is not working. Um, it will tell you if there's a mindset issue. It will tell you if you're buying too many courses, that is a 100% an esteem issue. Like you have imposter syndrome. We need, we need to fix it. We need to see where is that coming from? Your numbers can tell you a lot. But more importantly, you cannot do the will of God if you are not in business. You can't do it. Everybody listen to that. You cannot do the will of God if you're not in business. Oh, my goodness, Virginia. Where can people go and learn more about you? Yeah, so you can definitely check me out on Instagram. It's Braun Virtual Solutions LLC. Um, all of my information is there. You can hit me up on Facebook. You can either look for Virginia Braun or Braun Virtual Solutions. Um, I'd love to hang out with you. And all the information is going to be in the show notes here and also on my different social media platforms for the five-day free challenge for financial peace. The link to sign up for Virginia's five-day challenge is right below this video. I really want to encourage everybody to go. I will be there. I cannot wait to learn from you, Virginia. Thank you so, so much. Thanks for having me. Such a gift. Here's the thing I want to echo, okay, on the tail end of this conversation. We all come into business, like, with a story about money. I, I, this is, I feel like I, I, I know I've done conversations on this podcast about your money story. Um, but, but it's just, I really want to, if, if you're listening to this conversation and it's caused you some stress or it's making you feel less than, or you're just like, forget it. I can't face this. I'm too afraid to face this. Your history with money is currently informing how you think about money. That is just a fact. You have beliefs currently around money that you might not even be aware you have. But this is like how we get holy. Like this is how we become humble. And I, I just like really want to encourage anybody, trust the Lord. If this is a painful part for you, trust 
that you are like a child and that God delights in little children. And the way that we don't yell at babies when they are first learning to walk and they fall, nobody yells at a baby for doing that. When you think about it, little toddlers, when they're just taking their first steps, we, we clap for them like for taking like one teeny tiny step. You know, a girlfriend of mine was over the other day and her son walked about like the length of my kitchen island and she was on the floor, like just like cheering for him, waiting for him. Like, I just want to invite you if money has been something historically that you have been challenged by to just be like a small child and just feel like with every little step you're taking that you are being cheered on. I am cheering for you. Virginia is cheering for you. Come join this five-day challenge experience where you will get cheered on. All right, my friends, let me know in the comments if this is something that was helpful. Uh, feel free to pass this podcast on to a friend who might have similar challenges. You cannot do the will of God if you do not have a business for those of you who are called. So let's get your finances in order and get you out making the impact and the income you desire. All right, my friends, thank you so much. We'll see you next time.